We'll get uh, right to this Michael Brooks interview with Ronnie Casrills. Ronnie uh, is a guy we inter interviewed a few times. Um, and what I like about this is how early it was. Um, in my majority report career, this is February 8th, uh, 8th? Yeah. February 8th 2016. Um, so I was there. I've been at majority report for about two months at this point, or, or four months at this point, and maybe five. Uh, and I had, I was only just starting to get a sense of how important this international vibe was. And this is also the first interview I remember Michael being significantly, uh, uh nervous for, he's very anxious about this. And if you, I was just watching this back and we played two different songs in the uh, break, which means, and I could see Michael the entire time. So I remember in this now that we had some kind of connection issue with Ronnie in South Africa and Michael's freaking out because this was his, this was the early Lula moment, right? Ronnie Caswell's is, yeah, I've been uh, reading the Mark Jeviser book on Tabo and Becky, A Legacy of Liberation uh, since Michael passed because it was the first book he recommended me reading. And Ronnie Caswell's comes up in that book quite a lot and uh, in pretty badass ways. Um, so uh you know, I, I hope you guys appreciate this interview now. I think you will. Um, I'm glad to give it a second airing. But uh, yeah, we'll go right to this uh, now. It's about a 45 minute interview. And uh, when we come back, we'll have uh, Jamie and Matt Binder with us. All right. Welcome back to the Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now, and it's really an honor uh, to be having him on, is Ronnie Casserles. He was a member of the African National Congress's military wing from, 19, from 1960 at the age of 21, um, and uh, a leader in the movement in the armed uh, struggle for the African National Congress. He was a deputy uh, minister of defense under the government of Nelson Mandela in 1999. He became water minister and, and was the minister for the intelligence services under the presidency of Thabo Mbeki, who was the second president of a democratic South Africa. Ronnie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good day. So w let's start the conversation. You're involved with a new uh, film project called London Recruits, uh, which documents the work that you did in the UK um, with a number of British students in the 1960s uh, to sort of essentially keep the presence of the ANC alive in South Africa. Could you explain the context of where the ANC was, where the armed struggle was against the apartheid at that point, and what led you to London to work with these London recruits? Sure, but if you don't mind, mm -hmm. you said British uh, activists. Mm -hmm. They were recruited in London, Britain, mm -hmm. um, by myself, amongst other people from mm -hmm. the ANC. But I want to quickly add that we recruited people from many countries, including your own Danny Schechter from New York, who unfortunately died yeah. um, sometime last year. I met him at the London School of Economics, and he was one of the volunteers. We had um, like young people, workers, trade unionists, he was a student at the LSC, mm -hmm. and amongst them were Scots and Irish and Londoners and Welsh people, British people, uh, French and Greek and Dutch and Canadians and so on. But to get to your question about the context um, and what brought me to London and involvement in recruiting uh, young activists uh, to go to South Africa and uh, smuggle in literature, material, leaflets, and get them distributed in some exciting ways. Um, one has to recall the early part of 1960, that decade, you know, the world came to really know uh, South Africa uh, as a result of the Sharpful massacre that killed 68 people in cold blood and wounded 200 others, uh, African people, black people who'd been protesting against the infamous pass identity laws, um, and Nelson Mandela and other leaders go underground, a struggle that had basically been 
along non-violent but very active um, lines was a struggle that now embraced um, sabotage action on on, on the way to the utilisation of armed struggle. I was one of those involved and uh, with a crackdown that came with Mandela's arrest and the arrest of leaders in the Rivonia raid and trial, Susulu and Becky Goldberg with Mandela and uh, a number of others sentenced to life imprisonment, there was this almighty crackdown on the ANC liberation movement, South African Communist Party, and uh, the movement was all but crushed. It certainly didn't have any ability to produce a leaflet and get it distributed. People were lying low, those who weren't in exile or in the prisons. Um, Well, I was fortunate to escape arrest and worked in Tanzania under the leadership of Oliver Tambo for a couple of years. By 1966, he sent me to London to join with the other leaders there. I was a youngster, I wasn't a leader, but to join with Joe Slovo, uh, Dr. Yusuf Dadu, um, and they were a South African group there that was attempting to revive the underground within South Africa. London, okay, seven, 8,000 miles away, far further away from South Africa than Tanzania, where we had our headquarters. But um, the lines of communication, shipping, airlines, uh, this was very active, and Britain, the um, major trading partner, students from South Africa flocked to Britain, as did business people and tourists. So we hit on the idea of um, recruiting young, like some were older, white people that had to be fair-skinned. Um, so as not to arouse suspicious, to move freely in this apartheid race-minded state, to send them in, uh, uh, some through ships, through the the, the cruise ships, um, mail boats, as they were called in those days, in the majority by air, as tourists. And they were welcomed, and uh, as long as they didn't draw attention to themselves, they could move around uh, beyond suspicion. But in those days, <laughs> unlike traveling today, you know, you could jump on a plane, uh, you could stash anything in your suitcases. They weren't even searched. We, we, we built suitcases with false bottoms, in the bottom of which we had leaflets, and we trained these people up um, to distribute this material in quite imaginative ways, which we can come to. But the key thing was that the whole effort was to break through the silence uh, of a police state and get messages through to the masses of South Africans, uh, particularly the African, the black people, and the mixed race people, uh, who suffered so much uh, and, and under apartheid, to get the simple message across to them that the liberation movement was alive, that the ANC was alive, that um, that uh, there was hope that we would win in the end, that they should never give up hope. So it was the inspirational messages that were required. Um, to break, as I say, the silence uh, of the repression. That's really... And that's what yeah. led to this whole project. You know, I, one question that actually occurs to me as you describe this, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that, you know, the people that you recruited to do this are, first of all, they're very physically, you know, brave people. These are courageous people, very committed to their ideals, and they have leftist ideals, non-racial ideals, they're playing the role of tourists and presumably and obviously tourists who are comfortable either I would assume either sort of entirely apolitical to the extent anyone actually is apolitical or maybe even supportive of the apartheid system to the extent that comes up in conversation. But then at the same time, you're recruiting kind of the most radical and the most also just, you know, 
rule breaking. So as they went to South Africa, like, were there uh, times where just through sort of being themselves, they maybe did arouse some suspicion or were they like serious cadres and no problem? Yeah, well, look, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, first of all, they were young uh, in the main. There were some older people who were maybe in their 30s. But in the main, these were young people, very active in their trade unions. These were the, the British guys um, in the anti-apartheid movement in the uh, protests against the American war in Vietnam, in the CND campaign for nuclear disarmament movement. And quite frankly, some of them were just 19, 20, amongst them students. And amongst them was a wonderful student from Brooklyn, from the Bronx, uh, New York, uh, Danny Schechter. Right. Now, they, they were disciplined, they were serious, but they, they loved life. They, they were fun to be with. And Danny was the quintessence of that. So you put a guy like Danny into South Africa to behave like a tourist, not to draw attention to himself, as they were all uh, all, all, all told, and um, it's quite hard to do these things with irrepressible young people, and Danny's one of them. So he uh, goes into a fairly cheap type hotel. Uh, we didn't have money to put them in any any star hotels, <laughs> and uh, it's a hotel, therefore, that doesn't have any ensuite bathroom. It's got a, a, a bathroom facility. Uh, for people on that particular floor. And he ambles down the passage to run a bath, goes back to his room, where he's got his suitcase stashed with these, uh, <laughs> these, these leaflets, and he forgets that he's running a bath, and there's all sorts of commotion, and they come to the door, and you left the tap on, and so on. And this water is... Uh, down the passage, etc. So, of course, he apologizes and the, the manager understands, the white manager, and disappears because he's got his boys, in quotes, doing the job of mopping out. Right. So the boys are elderly African cleaners uh, who are down on their hands and knees mopping up the water. Our, our lad from the Bronx, without thinking twice, rolls up his trousers, gets down on the floor with the guys, and he starts mopping up as well. They are absolutely amazed. Right. Here's this white man who's doing this job, you see. And uh, fortunately, there was no white person around to see it. They would have just wondered what gives with this character. When Danny gets back to London and tells me about it, God, you know, I just can't believe it. And, of course, I, I, my heart skips a beat, but then I'm laughing because he got away with it. But, sure, this question of yours strikes to the humanity because that, that, that really was an expression of the humanity of Danny Schechter, of the humanity of these young Communist League um, activists who were many who, who volunteered, trade unionists, working class background, and others um, from, the, from the universities um, who weren't in any particular party as such, but non-aligned, but leftist and, and, and anti-apartheid. And, you know, I could regale you with some of the, the stories of these young British guys who get involved in some of the things. I mean, if there's time, I'll give you one. Give, give me, give story. us another funny story. Give us or okay. Or, yeah, there's, there, there, there's these two two brothers, um, the Bell brothers, B E L L. I call them the Bell Boys to this day. They well into their seventies, and um, this is Ron and Tom. They <laughs> crack jokes. They you know tend to to the to the minute. Um, they very dedicated in the British Young Communist League, very active in the anti-apartheid movement and in their trade union. And they've never been on a plane. They've never been outside Britain. So that's a huge adventure in itself. 
uh, we put them into a similar hotel to Danny's in Cape Town, and um, they go about their task. The first part is reconnoitering the city to see where they can place the devices which are going to deliver these leaflets, which I said we've come to. So they're in this hotel, and... uh, they um, chat to the receptionist and uh, some other woman who's working in the hotel, their age group, nice, attractive woman, and they take them out and they're in some nightclub uh, having their drinks. And these are women of relaxing. color, I'm assuming. Sorry? Are these women of color, are these black women that they're taking out? Okay, I'm coming oh. to that. Oh, not sorry, to, go. Not, okay, go not to their eyes, not to their eyes. Okay, it's sorry for all. stepping on your you line. You know, go Cape, ahead. Cape, Town, Cape Town, you won't find in those days a indigenous black African woman in a job as a receptionist. Okay. But it's a city still to this day with a huge mixed race population. And, you know, the color there is like the States, it's from very light right through to darker shades and these happen to be fairly light-skinned women (laughs) they're sitting in the club and they're chilling out and suddenly there's a police raid Um, the women jump up and they rush through to the toilet and uh, get out a back way and disappear so they've lost their dates the next wow. morning at the hotel, they asked them, what on earth happened? Why did you disappear? Why are you so frightened of the police? And they say, but don't you guys know? We shouldn't have been there. We're not white people. Oh, <laughs> We're God. colored people, <laughs> as mixed race people are called in South Africa. So, yeah, when I heard that story, I also cracked up, um, <laughs> but was so thankful that, that you know, it didn't lead to any calamity. Um, it didn't happen with every group who were in the country, but quite a few uh, um, incidents of this nature did occur. One of the British guys, uh, at a time when one of the ways of distributing was breaking open your your um, false bottom in the case, and then posting, we'd give them a mailing list and they'd post letters to several hundred people. And he went into the post office. There's a um, a queue for white people and then a separate queue for black people. And he stands in that queue. And a policeman's walking by and actually roughs the man up. Oh, wow. And says, what on earth are you doing in this queue? Get into your own queue over there and gives him a few blows. So, you know, the incidents of this nature do abound. But um, in the main, they got away with it. So, and, and so, well, let's move because I, I actually, there's some other broader sort of conversations I want to get to you with. But but tell us first, and then I want to draw on the importance of the of making this film and getting it distributed but you you have alluded to the sort of techniques that you use to get these materials into the country how the letters were snuck in how the pamphlets were stuck in the goal is to basically let people know that the struggle is still happening that there's the movement is still assembled and outside of South Africa and that the hope and resistance is still sort of on the move in some respects so what how did you how did you actually get things in the country and how did you actually execute distributing these things once they were in South Africa? Yes, right. You know, one one can't underestimate the impact of a leaflet about freedom in a police state yeah. or a slogan on a wall. Um so initially people were sent in, uh as I indicated, simply with leaflets in the mailing list, and they would post the leaflets. Then we evolved this to more activity. The next simple step was getting them to buy um, a length of calico, white material that you'd use for a banner, uh, paint a slogan on it, um, the ANC lives, Mm. and instruct them how to roll that up um, and get on top of a skyscraper. Plenty of tall buildings around in South Africa, not like New York, I'm talking here about 10 stories or so. 
they are higher, but you don't want to go too high. Right. And how to then unfold this from that position so it screeches out the message from the streets. And we would ex- we, uh, we would train them up with some very simple uh, timing devices to delay the unfurling of the banner. We wanted them to, to be away from the spot. And one simple way is tying it up with string and then dabbing a bit of acid on the string. So it take five minutes, say, for the acid to eat through. And depending on the ballast in the banner, uh, it would unfurl, and by then the people were, were away down the street. Um, this kind of activity in about 1966, 67, and so on, um, managed to break through the silence of the press because it was quite sensational. We then went to bigger stage, and we thought of using something like a rocket, taking a leaflet up into the air, and uh, then disengaging so the load would flutter down. What we hit on ultimately, after a lot of experimentation on parks <laughs> in London, uh, you know, when there weren't people around and so on, um, we, we basically organized what we called a bucket bomb. And we showed them how to construct this. We'd give them a little bit of some elements of this, which in the end, when they were in their hotel room, they would stuff leaflets into this bucket. Underneath the leaflets was just a little bit of a wooden guard so they wouldn't burn from underneath that, putting, using some black powder from a firework cracker and connecting that to a small timing device. Um, with a fuse, the leaflets were filled in that bucket. The bucket would be put into a shopping bag, and we would tell them to to leave these at railway stations, taxi ranks, bus terminuses, and the like, and uh, to time it so that it would go off 10 minutes after they dispensed with the load at a point in time when workers were coming out of factories or catching mm-hmm. transport. And we would get uh, we'd get these volunteers to work in pairs for safety. Without them knowing it, there would be others covering the major cities in South Africa. And at a particular time and day, all synchronized, something like, say, 30 of these devices would go off um, in, as I said, every main city. It was so sensational that this made headlines in all the South African newspapers. So that was the key way. Another very simple way was uh, getting them to purchase tape recorders, tape players. We would have them smuggle in with the leaflets, a small amplifier and a speech on tape and uh, instruct them to house us in a small box, find positions um, uh, from ledges of buildings or garages, multi-story garages, and again, a uh, simple time device to just switch it on before leaving. The first 10 minutes would be silent, and then a speech would um, blare out from the amplified box and... And um, eyewitnesses reported in the press of sensational activity in the streets as as the workers um, uh, voiced their support and the police rushed around to try and find the source of this and and smash it. Uh, But, of course, we, we got them to put a sign on saying that there's a bomb here, beware. So that kept the police away for some significant time. But it was this kind of activity I was referring to, this creative activity yeah. of getting the information across it made a big, big impact. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. And so before we move off from the London recruits, and I need to get your thoughts on contemporary South Africa and, and actually hopefully Israel-Palestine as well, there is this film, London Recruits, which recounts these stories, your role and many other people's roles in sort of putting this together, and then um, more of the stories that you talked about, more of the tactics and strategies. And it's really, it's a project of kind of unbelievable internationalism. I mean, there's something so innately 
kind of stunning and inspiring about, you know, Danny Schechter or a young person from the Netherlands or the UK or wherever else being willing to sort of go on that adventure and take tremendous personal risk to overturn yes. this obscene system. So talk about where this film is now and, and the importance of sort of seeing it through. It's in the making. A uh, British company in Wales called Barefoot Rascals. Um, the listeners can, uh, can, can, can get the information on the website, London Recruits, and they'll find much there about the making of this film. Um, funds are being collected uh, through um, crowdfunding in Britain. We raised a lot of money to get the film started. Uh, there's a whole process of getting money, and already contributions are coming in from the British trade union movement because many of the people concerned, men and women, were members and still are uh, of, of their trade unions. We are appealing to people in the United States and elsewhere to assist. Um, and the film is very important as you've indicated it's a story about tremendous courage it's a story about internationalism it reflects on uh, those heady times of the 60s and 70s where we recruited young people from the anti-vietnam war struggles from the states right across the world britain and europe um, anti-apartheid movement and you know it was a period filled with incredible spirit uh, people were prepared if uh, we had contact with them nobody really turned us down when we said would you prepare to go the extra step and go on a dangerous mission into South Africa and carry this message they saw the internationalism in that uh, and, of course, we have that need today. Yeah. That's the message of the film. Uh, it tells a story which was not very well known, and these recruits didn't brag about what they did. In fact, they felt and still feel that they didn't do very much, that the struggle in South Africa uh, saw immense sacrifices by South Africa's own people. Um, and, you know, it's people like Tabo and Becky and others who have been interviewed who say that they filled an extremely important uh, role in that period where we couldn't really organize the message ourselves within the country. By 1975, things were different and our underground was developing and uh, the mass movement in South Africa was gaining headway. But that particular period had that distinctiveness we needed so badly the uh, support that I've referred to as we need in the, in the world today I'm talking here about good positive things I'm talking about real international solidarity um, with oppressed with the um, exploited with people who are still struggling against racism against capitalism uh, countries which are very much under the heel of dictatorship are not talking in any way about jihadism this is irrational um, and so on we're talking here about internationalism where people know and understand uh, what the issues are about, what is required, uh, and very much it's the issue still of publicity, of information, of getting the solidarity messages across the internationalism which we've seen across the centuries and we saw so many times in the 20th century. So the message from the film uh, we hope revives the lessons of serving a good cause, serving um, the truth, serving to expose those who exploit and oppress uh, and bring inspiration for the kind of activities we've seen in the Occupy Wall Street movement, in the anti-war movements, 
uh, around the world in the protest against the absolute crying shame of 61 people in the world owning the wealth equivalent to the three and a half billion other half of the world, um, bringing people together in solidarity for real democracy, meaningful participatory democracy, for a move towards socialism, anti-war, and the emancipation of humanity. So, and it's really interesting in that the list and the motivation of this film, because that, that leads me to want to get your thoughts on the contemporary situation in South Africa, because you could have, frankly, quite rightly, at least in my view, after a lifetime of sort of political struggle and personal risk and then service in the first two democratic governments of South Africa, sort of, you know, uh, I guess, watch the game and relaxed. <laughs> but you're sort of still out there. And you wrote you wrote a piece, I believe it was in, two in 2013. It was called How the ANC's Fastian uh, Pact Sold Out South Africa's Poorest. And you sort of, and, and there's a transition here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you sort of criticized the ANC's kind of acceptance of kind of global neoliberalism uh, under the presidencies of Mandela and Mbeki, which you uh, served in. That's one aspect of it, but you still seem to uh, have, obviously, from Mandela a great deal, I mean, enormous respect. For Mbeki, a lot of respect. And in many respects, it might be interesting to get your thoughts on Mbeki because I think Mbeki, you know, there's a very fixed view of him in, in the West and the United States. Uh, but under Zuma, you have gotten to a point where this sort of critique of neoliberalism has, critique, has sort of fused with your concerns about corruption in South Africa, corruption in the ANC, to the point where you have left the party and you're sort of working on a new iteration of politics in South Africa, which is grassroots driven, which actually maybe harkens back in many ways to the work that you and so many others did in the ANC. So maybe if you could just sort of lead us through starting with this critique of the ANC and neoliberalism and, and where we are today. Well, um, one has to start with the incredible achievement of toppling apartheid yes. through our mass struggle led by the ANC. Uh, and the wisdom, uh, you know, it's not just Mandela. There was a collective leadership of luminaries, Governor Becky, Walter Sisulu, um, and so many others who were imprisoned with him and many who died. Uh, some uh, executed, like Vuyasi Lemini, the trade unionist, and others killed in detention. So a huge sacrifice. The world never thought that we would be able to remove apartheid. In the end, there was the negotiated settlement, and uh, mainly because, in the main, uh, the ruling class in South Africa and its political uh, elite, the National Party, from Britta to the clerk, saw that, uh, I saw the writing on the wall, that there would be a bloody revolution if they didn't reform. Uh, and they wanted a reform in terms of keeping property and the economic control intact. Um, at that particular point in time, 1990, and our first elections, 94, there's huge uh, bloodshed in the country. Many more thousands died in that period than in the period pre to the lifting of the ban on the ANC and other liberation movements in the country. Uh, so you, you, one has to understand yeah. that particular context. It's, it's not easy. Uh, in the process, though, I feel in retrospect, and there's nothing like 2020 vision, sure. um, but I feel that we actually could have got a much better deal given that uh, the masses were in the ascendancy, we had strong United Trade Union movement, um, and we had the support from the whole world. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, 
in the concessions which were made at the negotiating table, and there is give and take when you're having to get through a situation where you, you haven't beaten them on the battlefield, uh, but of course they're fearing the way things can go. Uh, in, in that particular situation, when we examine the compromises, we, we gave too much on the economic front. And again, when you've got the captains of industry and the leaders of the capitalist world saying to Mandela and leadership that if you guys go through with your um, radical nationalization, land redistribution, uh, you're going to be isolated. You're not going to receive any investments from abroad. You know, your, your country is going to be stunted and you know it, it's up to you and you're looking at the poverty in the country and you're looking at the violence from the right wing and you feel that the way ahead is through taking what's on offer because you know you'll win the election hands down as the ANC did well over 60 percent of the vote you take the political levers of power and along with Mandela and his able lieutenant and Becky very bright people and a collective, and I was part of it, you feel that let's have our hands on the levers of power and we will then erode the economic order and get to the point where we can control it. We did that, and that's what I call the Faustian Pact, and not just pointing finger at Mandela or Mbeki, who right, are our two right. most leading people. I, I was in the Communist Party as well as the ANC, Joe Slovo, you know, we all agreed to that. Um, a little bit of misgiving. Some of us said, you know, we could step up the struggle some more. Let, let me give an example in looking back where I say I think the balance of forces were more in our favor. That threat from the West or business and investment that we would be isolated and so on, um, would the African-Americans stood by in your country and allowed their government to put the squeeze on South Africa, would the anti-apartheid movement straightening the world have been silent in the face of those kind of attempts by, you know, what later is the Washington Consensus right. and the EU? We would have, we had that very important detachment on our side and the strength of our own people. So we missed that particular opportunity. And, you know, when I say a Faustian pact, uh, we accepted the political power in exchange for putting off the economic to another day. But what we do know, and we knew this before then, which is where I kicked myself in the... Uh, the, the pants, is that those who dominate society economically, even if they don't have the control of most political parties, they are able to call the tune. They erode your power. And this is the straitjacket we're in. Of course, the Soviet Union had collapsed. Not that we wanted a Soviet-style rule. We wanted democracy. But at least when pre the Soviet, when the Soviet Union existed, there was this this knowledge that we could rely on East European countries, China, socialism, to give us a balance against the West. But that that all broke down, which which made it all the more um, likely to go along with the scenario, which which I explain and call that Faustian pact. Um, the trouble is when you had, and I come to your question about Tabo Mbeki, the most brilliant mind amongst us, a man who had um, Marxist understanding, uh, very deep that is, who had a tremendous strategic overview of the world, and um, who was really with Mandela and after striving to walk this tightrope to help us get into a situation where we would become masters of our own destiny in terms of building our e economic power. Um, okay, you, one might say, well, that was going to be impossible even for Mbeki. I, I'm just making a point that with someone of the sophistication 
and I'm not talking in elitist terms, of an Mbeki, um, we had perhaps a chance. But at the same time, in that Faustian pact, you have building up forces which I would say are on the, the right wing of the ANC, uh, narrow nationalist groupings, people who are ready to to make the most of crony capitalism, which, mm-hmm. of course, is something very difficult to oppose, to defend, to prevent, if you aren't very, very rigorous. And that opening occurs, I'm not against the emergence of black capitalists in our country, but you need that occurring when you have very strong leadership. But when you have a leadership, and I'm talking about a leadership that succeeds Mbeki off the This is the current him, leadership of Jacob Zuma. Where you get crony capitalism uh, running unchecked, then you lead under the present administration and a president who, unlike Mbeki, was clearly facing very serious corruption charges um, and is still doing everything possible to keep himself out of court. And this is where uh, he had tremendous support from that faction, which has now grown and dominated the ANC in our movement, um, who want to make, make wealth for themselves in the first place. And this is where, instead of serving the people, you become and you find yourselves in a situation of serving oneself. So that at present in South Africa is the way the pendulum has moved. And one still hopes to see that uh, within the ANC and our liberation movement, that positive forces, and there is a struggle taking place, will come to the fore. But I happen to feel that uh, is good, and I support those comrades within who are struggling, but I feel that we need a voice, an organized voice to the left of the ANC now, uh, because we're not just talking about uh, the struggle against racial oppression. It's absolutely intertwixed with capitalism and capitalist exploitation, and we need a very clear-cut voice to the left of the ANC, which raises the question of socialism. In the past, that voice and organization was the Communist Party of South Africa, which I've left to join with a nascent emerging left socialist opposition out of trade unions, particularly the Metal Workers Union, NUMSA, uh, a united front which is uh, emerging, uh, and civil society. Uh, it's going to be a tough battle. I'm not, um, uh, I'm, I'm not over-optimistic about it. I think it will take time. But I think it will also speak to people within the ANC and the liberation movement as such uh, to, to get them doing similar work from within. But we're doing this work from without as pressure on our government and, and on our ruling party, the ANC. Well, uh, one more final question. We only have a, a couple of minutes left, and it's okay. all fascinating. But I really, I know that you like to get uh, the opportunity to also speak out. You are, uh, you know, a part of your identity is you're Jewish, Jewish revolutionary, Jewish socialist. You've, as part of that, spoken out a lot in on the issue of Israel Palestine. And I want to give you the opportunity in the final couple of minutes we have to share your perspective on that. Well, you see, for South Africans, it's not difficult to see the racist colonial uh, character of Israel, the supplanting of the indigenous Palestinian people uh, by Zionism, which is a a, a narrow, um, inclusivist nationalism using uh, the Bible to justify the claims that the land belongs to uh, the Jewish people and to none other. I mean, this is absolutely unjust. It's ahistorical. And the methods they use remind 
all of us South African freedom fighters, bar none, who have visited not just the occupied territories, Gaza, the West Bank, but Israel itself, to see the discrimination against Palestinians, against the Bedouin, against people of color within Israel, whatever they claim about their democracy, these are second class citizens, but of course the appalling military occupation, uh, the absolute horrendous siege of Gaza, the constant uh, killings of Palestinian people. And uh, as someone who's of Jewish descent, uh, when they claim that they're doing this for the Jewish people, I say not in my name, along with a growing number of, of, of Jewish people in the United States and South Africa, uh, Europe and elsewhere. Um, uh, Mandela said we cannot be free until the Palestinian people are free. And I, I take that to heart. So, look, we've, we've I've made the point about that. Please let me end by again appealing to your good listeners to give support to this great internationalist um, film that we're making, London Recruits, and to check our website, which is just London Recruits. They'll get enormous information about how they can help make this film and spread the word. Thanks very much it's, indeed. It's linked on our website. And, and Ronnie Cosrolls, thank you so much for your time today i appreciate it immensely a pleasure thank you okay everybody we are gonna go to the fun half in just a moment um that's a person you know that i've read about and been familiar with for for many years um so that was uh it's fascinating um become a member of the majority report today only on a show like this could I be receiving IMs while I, while I talk to really a objectively historical figure complaining that I did not do my right-wing Mandela impression to him. <laughs> I think that really distills the polls of this show. 